Hello and welcome to Long COVID Physio Podcast. My name is Darren Brown. I am a physiotherapist and I have experience of living with long COVID. And today we have a very special academic guest with us. We have Simon. Simon, would you do us the honor of introducing yourself? Hello everyone. So my name is Simon Bicari. I'm from Quebec in Canada. And uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at University de Laval in shared decision making and physiotherapy. And in a few weeks, I will be a assistant professor at University of Sherbrooke in the physiotherapy program. And right now I study long COVID. Fantastic. Well, we are so excited to have you on this podcast today because I know that we've never personally met. However, our worlds have collided via social media recently, haven't they? The, one of the many joys of Twitter. Um, so I'm so super excited to hear about your work. And, and I believe that there was a congratulations in order there with, with a new position you mentioned. Is that right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So I will be joining the physiotherapy program at University of Sherbrooke uh, as an assistant professor. Oh, well, congratulations on that assignment. What a wonderful achievement. So I've not been to French speaking Canada. Um, I've been to Canada quite a few times, but I've not been to French speaking Canada. So I have no idea what time of day it is for you, what it's like there at the moment, like what's going on with your weather? Because when we had the last Canadian on there, we're talking about minus 20 degrees, which to me just is not worldly. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I, and I, I talked with Jessica also uh, because we've been connecting thanks to you actually. Oh, <laughs> and uh, so in, in, in our part of Canada, it was minus 20. So in Quebec, um, it's 10 a.m. This, mor this morning and we just had this snowstorm of oh. 40 centimeters of snow. That's so snow. <laughs> 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 yeah, but we're used to it and we're actually happy because we, we can do cross-country skiing now because yeah. we have snow. <laughs> <laughs> so not too cold, a lot of snow and uh, yeah, so so we're, we're pretty happy about it actually. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> you like it then, you're used to it. So, um, so Simon, I, I hear a rumor um, and it possibly may be a rumor from yourself uh, that you have one of the only funded studies in Canada to research long COVID. Is this true? And would you tell us more about this? Yeah, so um, we started the work. Uh, so I'm, I'm like, my research program is about shared decision making, but more broadly about patient centered care. So uh, healthcare organization, for rehabilitation services. And I have a, a strong field in chronic pain and rheumatology, but I, I also bridge to, to, to other rehabilitation services. So when the pandemic started I, in Canada, it was in uh, end of February, March, um, we, we, like with the number of hospitalization, we already knew that th there was going to, to be a lot of scientific issue with the rehabilitation part. And the connection between hospitalization and community-based rehabilitation. So we begin the, the work um, there, uh, like close to a, close to a year ago. And um, and at the beginning we were like only using pilot funding, mm -hmm. um, and and we studied tele rehabilitation as a way because it, it we didn't know at the time about like the duration of the infection after after two weeks and there was so we we knew we, we needed a tele rehabilitation program um and so we 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 started from a pulmonary rehabilitation framework in the community and we started from there first first study um, and we recruited patient was a proof of concept study to and it, it will be close to publication which is like publication takes time so we're february uh, it took several months to to do the peer review so um yeah <laughs> we're going yes it's a process <laughs> so it, it was a proof of concept study to to verify if it was possible to follow uh, hospital post hospitalized patient mm -hmm. in their home okay. was it was it uh was it safe 
Mm -hmm. um, so very small number of patients, so 10 patients, uh, and we followed them up for, for, for eight weeks. And we, understand, we understood a lot because we wanted to, to do clinical trials for this population. So how do you recruit? Because there, there are COVID-19 designated hospitals. So how do you reach the patient for consent and for, for recruitment, which, which is actually extremely complex? Uh, and limited our sample size. So we, we started from there. And at this time, there was the CARFI study that, that demonstrated that at two months, there are like 44% uh, 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 of patients um, reported persistent symptoms following their, their hospitalization. Uh, actually, 44% reported a, uh, a significant decrease in their quality of life on the Urocall visual analog scale. Yeah. And they, they, it's the first study that reported that close to 90% had, had at least one significant symptom at two, two months. And in our study, um, we, we had the contrary. So we all patients had reached, had improved uh, at least 10 points on the, the uh, EQVAS scale. So we had a signal there that they could be something that, that we could do. Um, so basically with this data, we, we wrote grants and there are two level of grants. So we wrote uh, national level, level grants, which we were not able to, to, to get because at this time in the story, it, it was still like research funding was mainly going to, to therapeutics, vaccine development, which was the, the complete emergency yes. at this time. And, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more later, but like running a rehab clinical trial at the speed that's required in funding, in emergency funding from national level grant is extremely complex. Like you need a platform that almost doesn't exist in the world. Not you. Um, so we, we, we missed this one, but uh, the, the, our hospital foundation in Sherbrooke, the Fondation du Centre de Recherche du CHU, uh, gave us some funding to, to get the program started. So this, and we're very happy and, and we thank them a lot for, for this funding. And during the summer, so we, we were planning the clinical trial because we had the funding. And this is at the time where long COVID became a thing, right. like the definition that was done. And, and all the conceptual work saying like, okay, long COVID is coming. Long COVID is actually like, like hospitalization is actually the point of the iceberg. Like long COVID is the wave that's happening after. And so the mindset at this time was, okay, but we're going to take all the program for pulmonary rehabilitation Mm -hmm. And we're going to translate it to, to long COVID okay. research and clinic. That's what, what made sense for people who didn't know about uh, post-viral illnesses <laughs> like we, we know now. Yes. So we, we, we focus, so we, we transition the research program, not only for post-hospitalized patients, but for long COVID as a whole. Okay. So we refined the intervention and we were like learning as fast as we could to, to design the protocol. And the, 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 what took time from a research point of view at this time was, how do you design a protocol to study the effectiveness for long COVID? Because you need a control group and your control group is natural recovery. So in, in rehab, like, is, is it like the question, the scientific question at the time was, well, is it relevant to give like 10 physio session to every patient with long COVID? Right. Because they, they most likely need to pay and you have problem with resources right now. So you need to compare this group to natural recovery to, to ensure that, yeah, it, it's, it's valuable to, to actually pay for, for this service and try to accelerate the, the rehabilitation. And that was difficult because mm. <laughs> how do you study the natural recovery? How do you create a control group 
from a disease that you don't know the natural recovery? Well, yeah, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? So, so can I just what are the trajectories? Like, how do how do you do that? So, so it's so so that I can understand. Then, so you've got you got original funding when there was a lot of attention on the acute aspect of coronavirus. So very early on, um, and obviously, congratulations for getting that funding. And your initial intention was focused on. Um, hospitalized patients that had left hospital and you were planning to use a existing model of rehabilitation so pulmonary rehab which uses education and exercise interventions and then the landscape changed and you realized that there was an enormous group of people that weren't hospitalized that had symptoms that included post viral symptoms uh, and so therefore you've learned that your planned intervention possibly needed to be modified or reviewed and then there are trial issues in terms of well how do you know that something works as an intervention if you don't understand the natural course of what could be perceived recovery so it the sounds like yeah. so it sounds like you've gone through quite a a journey with this process so far that like that must be a whirlwind yeah and so and the whirlwind happened like in october so in september there is the this this conceptual paper in the in the bmg about primary care management of, of, of post-covid Yes. And in this paper, what that, they, the they Trish Greenhow paper, yeah, the, the, the Trish Greenhow papers. So, the, so, so they talk about primary care in general. So there is everything in there from mass to pulse oximetry, mm -hmm. and there is this 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 chunk of text about pulmonary rehabilitation in primary care because they already have clinic and they are already testing some stuff. Um, and they report like several hundreds of patients already seen in, in, in these clinics. And they, they, they already, like if you read the paper, there are the safety advices that are beginning to emerge. It's mm -hmm. not they, like they, they, don't, they don't go directly safe, saying it's a safety issue, but they say that it's, it's a possibility. But like the mindset in September was like, okay, bring pulmonary rehab to primary care. And like from a scientific point of view, it was easy because you had so much evidence. You, you have like in pulmonary rehab, you, you have like the clinical trials, you have the, the, the trials, the, the non-inferiority trials that show you that you can use tele pulmonary rehab that it's not inferior to, to, to uh, in presence rehabilitation. So basically, you can you can calculate sample size. You can you can you can do everything that that you need from a scientific and clinical trial point of view. So, and then it accelerated because um, there was the the first draft of the nice guideline for long COVID, mm -hmm. and there was this political announce that they were going to to fund forty long COVID clinic. And it was going to be with a, a, a multidisciplinary research program because we had also Trisha Green all the work um, with the 114 qualitative interviews and they, they, they planned the organization of healthcare around this. And like it all accelerated. And the, the question I had at this time, because we're still trying to figure out how do you do this control group? And there was the regain trial that was announced in, in November that well basically is a pulmonary rehab framework with uh, psychological therapy um, that was announced 1.1 million pounds. There was 10 million pounds for the, the network of clinic. Um, and that that all happened at the same time, like the draft guide, nice guideline for this is the framework for the clinic. This is where we're going. And, and I was still trying to think about how do you do this control group? Because you have no <laughs> idea about the trajectories. And I'm like, okay, they must know something that I don't to, to take decision with yeah. such certainty. I was like, Okay, what's what's because I like I, I passed like 80% of my day reading the evidence 
<laughs> like I'm not that confident that that we can do something like this. Um, but seeing this, we kind of accelerated our ethics committee and we said like, okay, we're going to follow. And like, this is our physical activity uh, framework. Um, and we had, work, we, we had started to work with patient partners because I do all my stuff with patient partners. Fantastic. Uh, we had long COVID patient partners that we tested the program. Um, and we had signal at this time that there was something not right. We I mean, say like, okay, uh, they, they need multidisciplinary. Physio only was not enough. So mm. didn't knew. Um, and so we we got the edX committee because at this time, like it, there was no signal otherwise. Um, but like in every clinical trial, you still you still assess adverse event and arms, but in a more broad way, like you you monitor, but not precisely. So we obtained the edX committee um, for our study, and we knew that we were going to be a smaller study than the the the, the, the regain trial. It, it was normal. The regain trial is five. I got the protocol here. It's it's five hundred thirty five patients. It's, very use, randomize everything. So we, we said like, okay, we're going to do our clinical trial, but our clinical trial will still like, we still think that we're not ready for a randomized one. We're going to do a, a fast clinical study, pre-post, very simple design. We're just going to follow 56 patients mm -hmm. and we're gonna see if there are different groups trajectory and we're going to better understand our population because clinical trials are designed on the PICO framework. Yes. Population, intervention, control group, and outcomes. Yes. And even the outcomes, like you have a disease, long COVID, for which you have so many different possible symptoms. Mm -hmm. How do you decide your outcomes framework? And we say like, okay, the, the only way we can do that is test an open, an open set of outcomes. So we have pulmonary outcomes. So we use the, the CAT scale. So it's a COPD assessment test. It's a, it's a validated scale they use in, in the COPD research for the impact of pulmonary symptoms on quality of life. So that was validated. We said like, okay, we're going to use it because there was other research that was published um, with post-hospitalized patient that used the scale and we said like, okay, we can compare to some of the court. We used the EQ5B5L as a measure of quality, general quality of life and the EQ visual analog scale for general quality of life because it made sense. We had other courts with this data so we could compare like how, how we're moving because we're not, we're not randomized here. We're pre-post. So we need some kind of data to compare to other courts to see if there is signal. And we add fatigue. So when, when I first saw fatigue a few months ago, I said, ah, fatigue. I work with rheumatology patient. We know about flare of fatigue. And I dive in and like, no, we don't really know about fatigue uh, <laughs> that much. Uh, there are multiple tools to assess fatigue. Um, most of them are not that good in terms of psychometric properties. Yeah. Uh, so we ended up choosing the Childer fatigue scale, okay. um, which actually is the, the scale that made us understand the PACE trial. It's like the connection is there. This is how we found about it. Um, and the shoulder is, is a, a, a 50, a, it's a 11 item scale. There is another version with 14 items, but the most uh, recent one is, is 11 items. And we found that it was the, the, the tool for general assessment of fatigue that seems to be with the best psychometric properties. And we had a study in a preprint that used the shoulder in long COVID patients. So we had some, something to compare. 
but even this tool is is problematic. So if you if you go into the details of the, the old phase trial problem, and we can we can talk a little bit more about it in a moment, um, the Childer as an outcome measure for clinical trial in post viral fatigue is very limited, almost problematic because it got a a, a ceiling effect. So you you cannot uh, it's a floor ceiling. I'm sorry. <laughs> so so you got a, a you got a, a maximum effect at which you cannot really measure the impact of your intervention for most patients with post viral fatigue. So that's one of the issue with this 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 fatigue scale. But mm -hmm. I'm stuck because I I have like if I don't go with this outcome measure like all the other ones are, are less validated. Um, so, so I take this measure knowing the very possible limitation and this will influence how, how we do work and how we, we actually assess fatigue in clinical practice. We have tools, but we have limited tools right now. This is very important to, to, to understand. So, we have edX committee with this open intervention framework, with this open outcome measure framework, and we post it on social media because, well, the edX committee allow us to do that. And then I learn about postnatal <laughs> fatigue and MECFS. This is how I connected with mm -hmm. this community. And like precis precisely at this point, I, I became aware of the Davis study um, that is still in preprint, the patient-led COVID-19 research group study with the 3,700 patients. Uh, and this study is fundamental in all the science. It's, it's an online survey. There are sampling biases, there are limitations, but quite honestly, like you read the paper, it's all in there. The, the authors are, are, are just awesome. They, they know about the limitation. It's, it's not, yeah, it's like, it's a picture of what can happen. Like this study is, a, is an emergency signal. This is what it is. Like it, it doesn't give you the prevalence of long COVID from all patients. This is the only MS study, and I, I would like to have an update on that very soon from you. But this study, combined with the response on social media, tells you one thing, like we did not add the appropriate framework to rehabilitate and help the rehabilitation of long COVID. That and is this starts everything from there okay so that sounds like you've gone on an incredible journey not only from where you you mentioned you'd made some learning points but it sounds like getting all the way up to the point of promoting the study on social media has led to a complete 360 turnaround for you and your study team because you've gone through talking about what is the natural course of coronavirus and also long COVID. And in that, what does recovery look like? And actually, we don't necessarily have that either, do we? Because we don't have the observational studies other than the patient-led one that has shown us what the natural trajectory of coronavirus and long COVID is um, and what those trajectories look like in terms of the episodic nature, the improving, the static or the worsening, and what are the risk factors for that? We haven't got that. So it sounds like you've gone through an incredible journey to not only try to identify that as a limitation, the issue of a control group, which is going to be necessary, modifying your study so that it then becomes uh, an intervention uh, that has a pre-post evaluation, um, but then also the limitations of outcome measures and measurement tools. And, and clearly, you've come across the field of MECFS with that, learned about the hotly debated PACE trial and how that has clearly come to you realizing the importance of post-exertion malaise. So I stopped the study. At this you stopped time. the study? Wow. 20, 24 hours. Like I, I received this. Like I, I received 
like my lack of knowledge <laughs> directly in my and and like I do patient oriented research. I'm trained in patient oriented research for the last three years. And like when patient come at you with something like this, you stop. You just stop and listen. And, and like say. and like you realize in 24 hours, like there is something there and you cannot continue with your course of action. It's, it's hard because like you've been working on this protocol for like four or five months, but that was the right thing to do. So I stopped, I called the edX committee. I say, oh, we stopped. Um, <laughs> and, and we have, at this time, we haven't got patient in the trial. So that's, that's fine. But we have all these, these stories that are happening. Um, so, so you stop and you take time to, to, to reassess, listen, and, 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 and it's like, we, we need to have the same scientific rigor as every, like there was, there was issue with the Oxford vaccine somewhere like in, in November, they stopped, they assessed the adverse event and they took decision. Yes, absolutely. There were issues when they started vaccinating because they, they were, they were uh, allergies reaction at this time. They stopped, they assessed the situation and they make correction. Mm -hmm. Like we need to do the same thing in rehabilitation research. Absolutely. And I must admit, Simon, I think that one thing that I've particularly noticed is that from a social media response, that level of... Um, hearing what people have said that you've demonstrated and the reflexivity that comes from that has actually been so well received um uh, you know i don't want to blow your trumpet but because of what you've done you are being celebrated as a researcher because you're actually hearing and listening and not telling us we're wrong <laughs> which is which is interestingly uh, uh, unique which it shouldn't be um because yeah which is a which is a shame which, which is yeah. but but it's you 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 are certainly being applauded for that approach because not a, a lot of people living with long covid just like a lot of people living with long-term health conditions or any health condition want to be involved in the responses to that and certainly at the moment with the rapid pace of responses to the global pandemic and now to long COVID, there does not seem to be much space for pause, reflection and actual clinical academic debate about the right steps forward. So your approach is personally what I would be calling for, which is hearing. And so I want to thank you for that because it's incredible. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, th thank you very much for this. Um, honestly, I think it's, it's really influenced by my shared decision-making study and background. Yeah. Um, because like ultimately when I, I thought about this, like, I, I thought like, okay, if I had a $1 million trial and I have like all my staff there, like I'm, I'm just like using one hundred thousand dollar per month of research funding. Like, how would I have reacted? Because it's a small study, so I had the flexibility to to respond and to react. Mm. And I'm like, ultimately, I'm gonna tell you, and I'm 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 on the record here. So when I do get to the level with that, where I can manage a $1 million trial, <laughs> I am going to do the exact same thing. So I'm on yeah. record. <laughs> and why, why is that? Why is that? Like I, I dive down in the face literature and like for a month, like with my team, we've, we've been studying like what, what happened because actually you have like four decades of problem and like the PACE trial is like, one problematic trial of all this literature. There is a Cochrane review on this, which is also problematic. You have a new uh, systematic review that explains 
the history of all this and why it's problematic, it's not the first one. There, there is an old history there. And you know, I, I, I study shared decision making. Shared decision making is about deciding with the patient, um, balancing the evidence and the patient value and preferences. That's the principle of research that I'm studying. Yeah. And most of my program is about chronic pain and opioids. So we're trying to de-implement opioids because it got known arms, but patient, a lot of them need this medication to function. So you're trying to do the balance. Mm. It's the same framework. Like here we have a armful therapy, not a possibly, it's it's like when, when you have like more than 50% that from a patient that report arm, it's a armful therapy, there's no question there. <laughs> so we have a weak evidence and we have patients that are literally terrorized by this narrative. Like from a shared decision-making point of view, you're not discussing like, oh, is the, is the trial really good? Because it's a trial that scale, it's, it's a good scale on the Pedro scale, but like you don't even need to get into the metallurgical thinking about this trial. When you have such a gap between patient, what patients feel about this and, and what you think is something resembling evidence, like in shared decision-making, when this happens, like you <laughs> listen to the patient, like the, the numbers are, are just mathematics. The patient is the experience. They receive this therapy. If they tell you that they are afraid of this therapy, I really don't care about BP <laughs> under 0 0.05. So, so basically, the, like when you design the trial, when you design the study and this happened, like you, you listen to the patient because they are living the, this therapy that you're trying to, to, to force on them. It's just yeah. it's this basic patient-centered care principle here. Absolutely. So I think my obvious question, which I'm not going to ask first, but I will come to, will be, so what have you changed? Uh, but, <laughs> or what's next? But before I ask that question, and I don't know whether you're allowed to tell us or not, because I'm sure it's all under some sort of embargo, but um, my question is actually going to be, more around the learning process that has happened through this, which will be, um, first of all, applauded and celebrated, not only by people living with long COVID, but also by the MECFS community. Because if anybody is listening to this and doesn't know about uh, the trauma that you mentioned by uh, that's been experienced by that community following the outcome um, and the persistent uh, output from the PACE trial, um, which was around uh, exercise or graded exercise therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy as an intervention for myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, the learning you've gone through on this journey, the, the, the skills that you've utilized to go through this learning and reflection and reflexivity, is that something that you are going to publish? Because that in itself is such useful information, how you got to the point of where you are now. Because this rehabilitation has a complex history in terms of research. Uh, so for anyone listening, I'm both clinical and academic. So I love these academic discussions. I get a little bit excited about them because a lot of the time academic rehabilitation research is focused on a model that's very biomedical. And we know that obviously rehabilitation is not biomedical, it's biopsychosocial, although that term also has challenges in the context of other health conditions like MECFS because of the traumas that have been um, experienced. And so frameworks of rehabilitation don't always, or research rehabilitation, don't always need to follow the same thing and can in fact make our own paths. And that path can include learning from the errors or mistakes or blind spots that we weren't aware of. And so maybe this is an incredibly leading question or more be, maybe a plea, are you gonna publish <laughs> a reflection on what you've learned for this? Because it could, be 
transformative for the way that rehabilitation research is conducted? Yeah, so um, I'm really invested in patient partnership. So like I do patient partnership. I love working with patients. Um, I would like like every patient in my studies to be a patient partners, but sometimes they need to be a patient, not a patient partners in the study. So sometimes we have we have difficulty because we just we talk to them and we ensure that they have the best experience when they come to a clinical study. Um, so so I'm really invested in in the science of patient partnership, and this mm -hmm. is what we're learning here. We're learning about like it's not about one or two patients in the clinical study it's it's building a clinical study and a rehabilitation paradigm with two patient community a naive patient i'm sorry for the term the, the term we use in research so long covid patients are actually naive patients and they are being supported by the mecff community as a whole that are experience in their disease and their and living with 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 these symptoms and these disabilities so like i've never seen a story like this in like everything i've studied about patient partnership like two communities around a scientific issue um yeah i'm going to tell the story i'm going to 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 i'm going to tell the story because this needs to be known to the scientific community what the rehabilitation community is doing right now with the patient and the clinician because right now like the the pace of the clinical trials and rehab for long covid is not going fast enough mm. it's not going fast enough so so we need like experience is experimental ex experience learning from both the communities and the clinicians because there are clinicians all over the world right now that you're are following your leadership uh the leadership of uh, of uh, clark uh, nicola and uh, and michelle from physio for for me um and 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 we're building experiential evidence like right now this is the phase that but the, 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 this is a story of patient of worldwide patient partnership here and and it's awesome and and we're going to uh, I am learning a lot from this like <laughs> emotionally speaking like I'm learning a lot and still and 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 uh, so the story is not finished and there are journals that are interested in these stories and mm -hmm. and 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 they are editors in chief that wants to publish patient voices and and like we can say it, but we have one paper, me and you, and that was written with patient partners, both long COVID and MECFS. And we've taken, like this paper is important for me mm -hmm. because we have taken the peer review process. It's, it's in the peer review. The, the, the paper is about uh, what we propose as safety measures for long COVID and MECFS. And, and we've sent it to a journal and it's peer reviewed. So once we <laughs> finish the process, it will most likely be, be published in, in a journal and it will be, be assessed by external reviewer. And that's the way to do patient uh, oriented science also. Uh, that's the, the way to, to it's, yeah, it's, it's editorial format. Yes, it's a vision of a, a group but once it's peer review it's 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 quality patient voices <laughs> uh, because you, you work the text you reflect you you send various version and 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 this we need to see more of this because not all journal publish patient oriented research and, and that's fine but there there is a space in the literature for this and it's it's important because honestly, if we've been doing, if we have been doing patient-oriented research in MECFS for 40 years, perhaps we will not be at the same point right now. And that's, that's important. 
And that's a message that many people in the MECFS community living with MECFS have been saying all along, haven't they? Which is, if only there had been the investment in this uh, this area of uh, science and healthcare, we could have completely had a different story right now. Um, so I want to know where where I'm going with the study. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. So you oh, you jumped ahead. Okay. So yeah, I was going to ask the next question, wasn't I? What's next? Do you know what's next? Yes, of course. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I know what's in three to four months also. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Give us a synopsis then. So we've, we've heard all the big learning, the reflection, the reflexivity, the massive transformation in um, perceptions and frameworks. So what's the next step and what's changed in this study? So what we did um, with the study, uh, so as of last week, I got the new ethics <laughs> approval for the study. Never an easy and process. And we're seeing the first patient uh, in the study tomorrow. Oh, great. So we did, well, several major things. <laughs> <laughs> we changed the objective. The okay. <laughs> Start from there. Um, Okay, so we knew that the physiotherapy intervention was, was not the good intervention. Okay. Um, but we knew that there was a framework to help patients that was most likely a safe framework, which is the stop, rest, and pace framework. Mm -hmm. So you focus on the rest. You, you stop over exert, exert, exerting yourself, you focus on the rest. And when you do back your activities, your lifestyle activities, and for certain person, they will try to, to go back to physical activities that, that can happen. Um, you need to apply the principle of, of pacing. So both in... Um, the systematic review on, on uh, MECFS that was published and in like the, the Davis study, it's proposed as something that is acceptable as a, a paradigm for, for patients. Um, so that's the first change. So basically we, 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 what we did is that we took the framework that was proposed for a, a long COVID clinic which is multidisciplinary rehabilitation. There is physio, there is occupational therapy. So we add an occupational therapy components. Fantastic. We change the, the paradigm. So basically like it's a multidisciplinary rehabilitation with physio and OT based on the paradigm on, of stop, rest and pace. So basically your intervention is about educating and supporting patients in their recovery journey. It's not about giving an exercise program. It's about educating what's happening and supporting their, their, their trajectory. Uh, so it's a complete change of paradigm. They yeah. may be in the journey, uh, some patient that will want to try to go back to a certain level of physical activity, so we educate like how to do this safely and we, we teach them like the, the current principles like uh, heart rate monitoring. Um, so so we, we teach them. Hmm. So that's the, that's, the, that, that's the paradigm and the objective number one is to verify is this new paradigm multidisciplinary is it safe? Good. So it's a safety study. And how we do that? So we already add our basic adverse event monitoring, but we added the DePaul questionnaire. Uh, that's the DePaul symptom questionnaire from MECFS. Yeah, the DePaul uh -huh. symptom questionnaire for post-exertional malaise. Perfect. So basically, like at the beginning, my mind was resisting like I said, like, okay, you're going to stream everybody with the, the poll and the one that don't have 
post-exertional malaise, you're going to give them the normal program. And patient partners said, no, 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 you don't do that. Because <laughs> you don't know when, when it will develop. And indeed, when you look at the Davis study, like the, the PEM uh, symptoms can develop over the first two months of the well, disease. I, I, so I, basically... And as a personal experience, mine developed after six months of exercise. So I had no PEM and I was doing graded exercise therapy. And at six months, I crashed and because I didn't recognize it. Sorry, I've jumped in. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's that's important. So it's a safety study. And we know that that PEM is among everything, one of the, 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 the most safe, most important safety issue. So everybody gets the poll. So the, the, the poll is, the, there is a previous version with five questions and the, the patient said in the development, it was published like in 2016, something like this. And the patient said, um, no, it's not enough. <laughs> you <Okay. the> new <laughs> version. So there is the new version, which, which has 10 items and you assess the frequency and the severity. And that's the one we proposed in the paper and that's currently in peer review. And there is the other version. So if you have a MECFS clinic and you really want to dive down, there is a complete evaluation of everything. Uh, but for research purposes, it was not very feasible to have this one. So every patient get the poll every two weeks. Okay. And we're just going to document if, how it happens. And everybody got have a, 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 a adverse event monitoring journal and everybody have the activity journal. So lifestyle activity and any activity they do. So if a PEM shows up and we teach them, we have educational module to teach them about what is PEM and how you recognize this. And this was like informed by discussion we had with patients because ourselves, uh, myself, I, I, I cannot tell you how it feels except what I learned from patients. Uh, so basically, if a PEM come up somewhere in the process that we are teaching them to stop, rest and pace, we're, we're gonna know. And we're gonna need to be able to cross reference with the activity journals. So the the monitoring, um, the monitoring uh, sequence actually help us in the intervention yeah. to teach them like, okay, you had a PEM, it was like your delay is approximately because it can be delayed from 24 to 72 hours to sometime more, it's very heterogeneous. Um, and then you can monitor how, how long it takes and, and this helps the patient actually know what was the trigger and like integrate this in your in your teaching for for the next steps Ooh. so so everybody got this change of paradigm safety uh safety structure uh so, <laughs> so that's that's the, the the changes we do so it's basically not exactly the same well, study. What, and what an incredible and, and, set of changes like wow that's remarkable and we what we did also is that we did kept um, some of the physical activity framework, but for yeah. later on, because there is also this group in, in the evidence that we see right now, it's basically between 25 and 30% of patients mm -hmm. that develop fatigue without the post-exertional malaise. So basically they, are, they don't fit the, cri the, the criteria. So, if you're long COVID, you're not like, it's not the same thing as MECFS until some point in the, in, in the, in the disease, you, you can actually, like you need, I, I know there are discussion in the new uh, NICE guideline, like I've been sent a 356 pages document that I'm still reading. They, they are talking about like changing the, the, the duration because right now you need to be at least six months in your yeah. symptoms to begin the investigation for, for the diagnosis. And they are like, they are updating uh, with the US uh, coalition for MECFS, the Canadian coalition also uh, about the new version of the diet. So I'm not a, 
specialize in MCFS. I'm learning as fast as I can, but there are something changes in the timing of the, the diagnostic criteria. Um, so, so we, in the study, we still kept uh, the possibility based on the clinical judgments of the clinician who are trained in the basic safety paradigm mm -hmm. to try to identify some patient who somewhere in the, the follow-up process could start perhaps going to, 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 to do a little bit uh, uh, more physical activity. So, so we, kept the, we kept this open based on the, the judgment of the, physician, uh, the clinician we train to deliver the, the, the program because we need to understand this, how, how, how it, I, we need to have this possibility, uh, but the paradigm, safety paradigms stay the same. Um, and we don't know how to identify these patients. Nice. Um, you, so, so this is the change to the study. Mm -hmm. uh, that was interesting because like we, we've been designing training programs like about what we know about the science right now. Mm -hmm. um, because already like private practice clinics are, are wanting to see these patients. So we, we need to urgently train them in the safety protocols. Mm -hmm. um, but they got so many questions. Mm. And they got so many patients. So we need still to be open to these different subgroups certification. Yeah. And the, the one that's most puzzling to me happened last week. So basically, I've been called by an organization and they say like, okay, but what, what do you do with older adults in long-term care facilities? Mm -hmm. Because right now, a lot of like the, the long COVID study was done on, uh, I think the the average age is like um, it's between 40 and 55 years old. So it's not older adult like 70 to 80 years old uh, with comorbidities in, in long-term care facilities. But in long-term care facilities, and we have many issues with managing these patients in, at least in, in Quebec, a lot of them will... Um, live the COVID in their own. So they're not going to be sent to the hospital. And the, the people working there told me, like they fit the definition of long COVID, even if they, like, they, they are 80 years old, but they can have a mild COVID diagnosis. They told me like, what do you do with this? Yes, very important. Because the, the, the basic framework is deconditioning. Of course. Like, and, and I received the, the, the WHO guideline for COVID-19 like a few, a few days ago that was published January 20, 25th. And it's there, like the framework for older adults is deconditioning. Yeah. I say, like, okay, but I, I don't know, but these patients could have MECFS like symptoms in their recovery. So if you apply deconditioning, you're not going to know. So this particular population, I, I, I don't know the answer. No. So I said like, okay, well, pulse oximetry, the pole of everything, just well, yeah. everything because, because we, we don't know. And, and like, how can this type of patient really explain their symptoms? So it's complex to, to apply. So same framework we need to be secure but at the same time these patients like like the question that was asked for me said like do these patients really are really at risk of developing MECFS and does the arm of being MECFS outweigh the arm of being deconditioned in a 80 years old patient in a long-term care facility I'm like yeah, yeah that's I mean, are the one <laughs> i think that you know with, with this um it's why there is such a contentious debate about the topic of exercise in the context of long covid and you, everything you've just said there is so so important but what's incredibly clear 
is that we haven't got the answers yet. But what's fantastic to hear is that the approach you have taken, not only in your current study, but also in your academic um, uh, work full stop um, and advocacy as well as an ally um, is around the safety and effectiveness of what we do in the absence of existing knowledge. And I think that's what's so, so important. And I know that certainly from our perspective over at Long COVID Physio with the great debate on exercise, it's why we've been promoting that we're not anti-exercise, we're pro-safety, because we want to ensure that there is um, risk stratification that uh, uh, assesses and continually monitors for the uh, risk of post-exertion malaise and potential cardiac involvement. Um, but certainly, it sounds like everything you've done there from your study is 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 trying to stratify people in the absence of existing stratification. Um, so, wow, it's 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 but really remarkable. everybody starts with the the same safety approach, and this is because yeah. It's, I like sometimes I, I get calls f from from uh, or get decision makers uh, from from administrative region and like for for um, for healthcare professional that got COVID and now long COVID they, they can't go back to work yes. and the same question is always asked can I accelerate rehabilitation the answer is no. We, mm -hmm. we don't do this. Like you, you don't try to accelerate anything here. You try to be safe yes. and, and you monitor and you, you study. And ultimately like the, where I'm going with this and like, if we're, if we listen to the MECFS community, we have better chance of helping long COVID patients. Yes. But at the end, the only way to thank the MECFS community for this service they're doing us is to invest research in MECFS because it's lacking and not just lacking is not even the word. It's like nothing, desert. Like it's possibly the, the disease with the the highest disability and they, they have nothing. Yeah. So that's where I'm going. So I'm, I'm like a, a, many long COVID patients will, will, will recover over a year, two year. I'm like super happy, super happy. But now my focus is, is helping the MECFS community wow. because mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm a rehabilitation professional and like Normally, like I'm supposed to give exercise. I'm not going to give exercise. I'm not going to study <laughs> exercise in MECFS. That's, that's not the way. But I've been thinking like, what can I do for MECFS? Well, I, I understand recovery or lack here, lack of recovery. So I can assess, I can document, I can describe. And how, how can this help? Mm. Well, it is help because the better knowledge you have about non-recovery in MECFS, the more evidence you have to help them get, get long-term disabilities funding, insurance, something that they are living with this terrible disease, but they have some safety, social safety net to, to ensure that they get at least a better quality of life. And that's where we can, we can advocate. I'm not going to give exercise program, but I'm going to assess, document to, to help them have a better experience, mm -hmm. not being at risk. So this is what we can do for MECFS community to support them. That's, that's, that's like an oblig a moral obligation we have with everything they are giving us right now. Absolutely. And what a 
an incredible rallying cry uh, for investment and active engagement, uh, particularly in that context, because there are overlaps between long COVID and METFS, whether they be the same or different, uh, there is lots to be learned in different and additional directions. Um, so Simon, I'm conscious that people listening to this may also be living with long COVID or even METFS and energy may be spent, but I want to, ask you one last question and the reason I want to ask you this question is because during this conversation it's kind of really highlighted to me that not only is your research important but filling an important gap but outside of what you're doing there are obviously other gaps and one of those gaps that really was highlighted to me is that we do not understand the trajectory of long covid and we also do not know what the epidemiological nature and extent of disability is. Um, whether you call that prevalence or not, uh, could be a topic for another discussion. But I wonder for you, you're obviously nailing what you're doing in the field that you're doing. Um, so if you could ask for researchers to fill a gap right now that may not be the same area as you, what would be that gap that would just support this whole research journey? Um, I think right now, like if, if we want to, to help patients, like right now, the research gap is about scaling up education. Education. Yeah, it's, it's education and change of practices uh, and scaling up. Uh, it's all like it's it's the feel of implementation science here that we're talking about. It's about accelerating, reaching every clinician mm -hmm. rapidly. So it's the principle of the learning uh, real, uh, learning L systems. Uh, it's working as a community. So this is all science. Um, so you start with with the awesome work you're doing with the podcast. You're doing knowledge translation. You're doing knowledge synthesis. This is what you're doing. Uh, so right now, what we need is to invest in what the, the products that 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 you created and and other clinicians have created and 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 create this community um, and accelerate implementation of of this knowledge and and do it with the high quality education science background and implementation science background. So yeah, I, I this is this is where we're at. Of course, there will be cohort study uh, assessing the trajectories, and there are epidemiologists doing this right now. I, I know this, but like for 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 to ensure safety for the patient, we need we need to scale up education and mm -hmm. do it in a scientific uh, uh, in a scientific way. Well. I think that may be a call to get some other people on a podcast that I'm thinking about now. I'm thinking about some very senior figures in the world of physiotherapy. <laughs> Simon, I want to say thank you so much for this podcast. I have thoroughly enjoyed listening and learning from you um, and also being in awe of everything that you have done. So I want to say thank you for the podcast. I want to say thank you for your research. And I want to say thank you for everything you are doing for more than one population of people living with health conditions. Thank you very much for everything you're doing also. Thank you very much. And thank you to all clinicians that are helping patients right now getting better. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We'll end the podcast there. Thank you.